change is here. And what we've been saying in the Caribbean and other cities for so long, the science is showing it. Only yesterday we heard from our Caribbean scientists who's doing some significant amount of work analysis on the Caribbean. And I'm just going to read briefly from what they've said. Ongoing analysis of the Caribbean's historical climate data is painting a picture of what an approximate one degree centigrade of global warming since pre-industrial times has meant for the region. One degree has contributed to a warming of both air and ocean surface temperatures in the, Car in the Caribbean, an increase in the number of very hot days and nights, longer and more frequent periods of droughts, an increase in very heavy rainfall events, higher sea levels, and more intense hurricanes with stronger winds and lots more rain. It was in September when our region experienced two Category 5 hurricanes, one of which, Maria, went from a Category 1 to a Category 5 in less than 36 hours. Unprecedented in both, both aspects in the sense of having two Category 5s hit, hit and fall in the Caribbean and the, the speed of which it attained Category 5. And we've had other climatic events um, in St. Lucia, extreme drought in 2014, in uh, St. Vincent de Grenadines and St. Lucia again. At Christmas, very, very heavy, unseasonal rains. Um, and we can go on and on in terms of these climatic events that have been facing us. The scientists have predicted that if greenhouse gas emissions continue at the rate at which they're going now, that in the next decade, we'll get to 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is not good news. And as they put it, the picture will be a harsher climatic condition for us. We in the Caribbean are trying to build and build smarter and be resilient. The IMF has said in a recent country paper that it will take a significant amount of resources to do so, and that the SIDS, generally speaking, do not have those resources, and a massive amount of grant resources is going to be necessary. So here this morning, we have a distinguished panel to discuss the current situation and with regard to the economic and social environmental impacts of the natural disasters on the affected countries and examine the potential effects on development gains and the country's capacities to implement the obligations under the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We'll also examine how the UNFCC process and the engagement of other actors can support the Caribbean in strengthening resilience. Our distinguished panelists are made up of the Right Honourable Keith Mitchell, Prime Minister of Grenada. Prime Minister Mitchell is the Chairman of CARICOM, is the Chairman of the Small States Forum, is the Chairman of CDB, and happened to have been the Prime Minister in 2004 when Hurricane Ivan devastated Grenada. And he, well, he's told me the story, but he had to wake up and start rebuilding on that, on that morning. We're also joined by Prime Minister um, Alan Chastney of St. Lucia. Prime Minister Chastney is the lead head of government of CARICOM, responsible for sustainable development and climate change. And those of you who've been hearing him speaking, whether it's in Washington or New York, or here more recently, you will hear the passion in the voice in which he's leading this charge on resilience and sustainable development for our region. Also with us is our Baroness Patricia Scotland, Secretary General of the Commonwealth Secretariat of the Commonwealth, yes. A Dominica, a Caribbean woman, who had, has had a distinguished career in public service and in the legal profession. We we'll also hear from her. My colleague from UNDP, Joe Joshua, Director of Climate Change and Disaster Risk Reduction, and he is responsible for the UN's policy and program activities in the areas of climate change mitigation and adaptation. And Mr. Pa Osman Jarju. Director of the Green Climate Fund, responsible for country programming. So I'm going to call Prime Minister Mitchell to first address us. We have the addresses in, in sequence, and then afterwards we'll open the floor for some discussion. Prime Minister. Thank you, Esri. I'm chairman of this morning's important session. Five distinguished brothers from the Climate Fund and your NDP. Distinguished Secretary General, of course, my colleague Prime Minister of St. Lucia, my sisters and brothers, all 
Uh, first of all, I want to thank UNDP for organizing this important event and uh, for the invitation to deliver this message on bolstering resilience for vulnerable countries <coughs> facing acute climate change risks and sustainable development challenges. I'm indeed quite passionate, as uh, as you would have indicated already, based on the experiences I've had on this important topic. I stand here today, friends, in solidarity with my brothers and sisters all over the, the globe who are bearing the brunt of the impacts of climate change. I stand here today, of course, as a Caribbean person, and as I speak, I recognize the suffering, the men suffering from the recent climate change related extreme weather events that our countries are facing. The devastation, the despair, the hopelessness, the bewilderment, I can attest to the state of affairs during my visit in the early days following the events on the shores of the Caribbean. The vulnerability of the Caribbean region to a diverse set of hazards is well documented. Indeed, it has been cited as the most natural disaster-prone region in the world. Last September, two Category 5 hurricanes, one of them the most powerful ever recorded in the Atlantic, swept across the Caribbean in two weeks in a wave of destruction taking lives, devastating infrastructure, and severely damaging the economies of our small, small climate vulnerable states. My friends, we have never experienced anything like this before. Two Category 5 hurricanes in two weeks, and one, Maria, going from a Category 1 to Category 5 in less than 36 hours. This signals a dangerous trend in intensity and frequency of these climate change related events. Six of our member states and three of our associate member states were affected. Oma devastated Barbuda, the British Virgin Islands of Tortola, Turks and Caicos Islands, and Anguilla as well as the islands of St. Martin and St. Barks. It also caused significant damage in the Bahamas and Haiti and affected St. Kitts and Nevis. Residents of Barbuda had to be evacuated as the island was uninhabitable after Hurricane Irma damaged or destroyed more than 80% of the buildings and almost all the infrastructure. To this day, many of the residents remain in shelter and other accommodation on the main island of Antigua. Maria left massive destruction in Dominica. The destruction we recognize has done parallel in that country's history. It accounted for 26 of the total deaths and 34 of the missing. 95% of the country's buildings were damaged or destroyed, and nearly all vegetation blown away decimating the island's Irish lush sorry rainfalls. Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Dominican Republic were also affected by varying degrees of the hurricanes. Arising from both events, an estimated 20,000 children have been affected throughout the Caribbean community. 32,000 people have been displaced, with 17,000 of these in need of shelter. The 2017 hurricane season in the Atlantic has been particularly active. Of the 13 named storms for the season, eight have been hurricane, and those four were major hurricanes. It has also been notable, both for the frequency of the hurricanes and the intensity. Of the five hurricanes which were category three and stronger, three made landfall in the Caribbean. And it could get worse, my dear sisters and brothers, in the coming years. According to a World Bank report, the finders turned down the heat. 
The number of severe hurricanes is projected to increase by 40% if global temperature rises by 2 degrees Celsius. And up to 80% should they rise by 4, 4 degrees Celsius, which is the more likely scenario based on current trends if we do not do anything. With the expected sea level rises in that scenario, there will be devastating effects in all small islands and low-lying coastal developing states since, but particularly those in the Caribbean. Most of those countries impacted by the hurricanes, as you can see, are since. The events of the last month underscore the fact that climate change is not a matter to be debated. For us, climate change is a lived reality. It is an existential threat to our entire region. One does not believe in the fact of climate change is real. Something has to be wrong with their heads. With that reality in mind, there is need to respond swiftly and to bolster the resilience of Caribbean states. Reconstruction demands an intense focus on economic, environmental, and social resilience. In addition to restoring physical transport and communication infrastructure, we'll have to develop and enforce building codes and regulations to ensure that any future damage from hurricanes and other natural disasters is as minimal as possible. Given the devastation caused by these hurricanes and in anticipation of the more frequent events, of a similar nature. There is a need to respond swiftly and to build back better for improved resilience. The reper repercussions of climate-related disasters such as these mentioned earlier weigh heavily on the development prospects of seeds, which all have inherent vulnerabilities. For example, damages in Grenada following successive hurricanes in 2004 and 2005 amounted to 200% of GDP. And you could imagine what this is like. A relevant example of the depth of the problem our region faces certainly is the case of the recent one in Dominica. That country was decimated by Maria, although not yet fully recovered from the ravages of tropical storm Erica which struck in 2015. The total damage and loss then was estimated at nearly 500 million US dollars, equivalent to 90% of Dominica's gross domestic product. Before rehabilitation and reconstruction was complete from that first event, a second climate event has now compounded the problems of Dominica. The estimated damage and loss from Maria amounts to almost 200% of GDP. That tells you the size of the problem faced. Our experience is that you borrow to rebuild. This is the experience we've had. Another climate event destroys what you are building. And then you have to borrow again to build, even as you, as you have not yet repaid what you have borrowed before. That compounds the debt burden of our region, friends. In a very, in a very almost diabolical way, construction adds to your GDP. Hence, your per capita income increases, and our countries are labeled as middle income countries. Quite fascinating. Then. Therefore, they cannot access concessional development financing based on the formula. It is a trap for all those countries. I acknowledge that there have been some positive signals coming from the international community with respect to at least temporary relaxation of the criteria with respect to eligibility for concessional development financing. I would like the sound of that music. The latest communique from a meeting of OECS Development Assistance Community, Committee, for example, asserts that, and I quote, 
Many factors such as devastating effects of a natural disaster and humanitarian crisis could conceivably lead to a substantial and sustained drop in per capita income of an affected country or region, especially in the case of small states." Unquote. Increasingly, the committee also pointed out that while there are benchmarks to evaluate con a country's middle, to, to, sorry, to elevate a country to middle or high income status, there are currently no rules no precedents under the current methodology for reinstating a country or territory that has graduated or later suffers a persistent drop in its per capita income below the World Bank high income level threshold. Recognition of the problem, my friends, is the first step to resolution. As a matter of extreme urgency, I call for vulnerability to be included as a major criteria in determining eligibility for concessional development financing. But that call has been made consistently for some time now. It appears to have been consistently falling on deaf ears. We hope the ears are beginning to open. If Caribbean countries are to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030, they need urgent access to financing including, for example, climate change adaptation. While we accept and agree on a need for accountability, which is clearly of our interest, in our interest, the process to get resources such as the Green Climate Fund sometimes can be very daunting and time-consuming. Time is of the essence in accessing those funds. As events such as these hurricanes are occurring more frequently, reconstruction thus must therefore be climate resilience in time for the next event which we sure will come. Achieving the SDGs will require a rethink of the financing required, given the high cost of rebuilding and the need to reallocate resources to sectors devastated by these natural disasters. The issue of financing to achieve the SDGs is of paramount importance to developing countries, in particular, in particular LDCs and climate vulnerable small states. The objective, therefore, must be to ensure a smooth transition from managing the consequences of disasters to risk informed sustainable development and strengthen resilience for future disaster events. My dear sisters and brothers, let me conclude by saying that despite the magnitude of the problem, despite the despair, our people has demonstrated the will, the courage, and the fortitude to build back better to build a more resilient region with a low common development pathway. Well, at the same time, working to achieve and even to exceed the targets of the sustainable development goals. Our view, there is no development pathway for the future. We want more for the generations of our people to come. We don't have a choice to protect the future of the generations to come. And thank you. And thank you for the special invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. I'm now going to invite uh, Prime Minister Chastney to the podium to address us. Prime Minister. established, but if I can also, General Secretary, so nice to see you here. Um, and my, my brother, uh, my mentor, um, Prime Minister, um, Keith Mitchell, and it's always so great to be here with you um, and sharing these moments, and, and congratulations also on being the chairperson for the small states. I, I don't think we could have asked to have a better person 
the helm of that important organization at this time. I really thank you, sir, for the work that you're doing. Um, I think the Prime Minister has done an amazing job of really outlining where we are um, and putting into context uh, where we stand today and, and, and the choices that we are now faced with in terms of how to be able to move forward. Because like all leaders of, of the world, um, we have an accountability to the citizens of our country um, who are sitting back patiently waiting to see what solutions we're going to bring. Um, because I don't want anybody in this room to believe that there is not fair in the people in the Caribbean um, in terms of what they have seen, particularly this last summer. Um, before I proceed, I really want in particular to thank the General Secretary Guterres um, from the UN for the incredible leadership role that he has played um, since the UNGA meetings uh, in terms of how to tackle the OECD issue because when he was a minister with Portugal, he was one of the people that was instrumental in uh, getting a, uh, a special dispensation for Jordan and Lebanon when it came with the migration issues from Syria. And it was on the premise of that and, uh, that he gave us all hope. But more importantly, um, that he actually came to Barbuda and he actually came to, to Dominica. And uh, Secretary, I really want to thank you for being helpful in causing him to do that. And, and why was it helpful? Because seeing it is completely different than, about, than hearing about it. And, and I know that he was really emotionally affected by what he saw. That the, the power of Mother Nature and, and uh, the daunting task that both Barbuda and Dominica face. Uh, and it's the same thing for St. Martin, the Virgin Islands, BBI, and Anguilla. But I just want to add one more thing that the, the Prime Minister um, did not allude to, is that this, is, this situation is not new to us in the Caribbean. Um, unfortunately, our brothers and sisters in Haiti have faced this incredible peril um, long ago. So if you go back to the earthquake in 2010, um, and over 250,000 people were left living in a cardboard box. And uh, we waited and waited and waited. Uh, and unfortunately, some of the things that are, are affecting us today, which means that there was this huge global mobilization to assist Haiti but the infrastructure within Haiti to absorb that capacity wasn't there. And as a result of it, by the time Hurricane Matthew came around in 2016, those same 250,000 people had to face a Category 4 hurricane out of a cardboard box. And after that, now over a million and a half people have left, been left homeless. And so when that is the history of our region, um, you can understand why people are fearful. The other part that to me that's important to be able to bring in context here today is very easy for us to talk about hurricanes and the impacts and not bring it down to a personal level. You know, so there were two stories that, that um, affected me considerably when uh, I know the Prime Minister went around to all the islands that were affected. It's when I heard the story of a, of a, of a family who as he indicated, went home expecting there was going to be a tropical storm in Dominica. By the time they got home, it was already a Category 3 hurricane, and they couldn't move. And by the time the hurricane came to Dominica, it was a Category 5 hurricane. And so the preparations that you would have put in place for a tropical storm certainly would not have been the preparations you would have done for a Category 5 hurricane. And what happened was is that the, uh, there was a landslide at the back of the individual's home. Um, the walls were breached. Um, he ended up being pinned to the ground and ended up breaking both of his legs. Um, his kids were swept away. Uh, and he, he was left helpless. And his wife eventually was able to find the children. Um, it, luckily for them, it was soft mud, and they were able to recover the kids. But after going through that devastation, when he uh, woke in the morning and they were able to take him out of the house, he broke down. And he broke down because the two cars that were parked next to his house were gone and they have not been able to find them. And it, it was not lost on him 
that could have easily been him or his family or his kids. And that's that's that is the that is the, the, the position that we're left in of, of being helpless. That's that's the definition of helplessness. And, and I want to take that 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 visual image in your mind as being a parent and not being able to help your children. To now apply it to where we are as political leaders who we are parents to the children of our country and we're being left in a position of helplessness. And I don't want anybody here to leave without understanding that. That that is what we're facing. Helplessness. And, and we're, we're an incredibly resilient region in terms of what we've been through. And one thing I love about Caribbean people is that they may complain, but they get up and they do what they have to do. And they may mumble under their breath, but we do what we have to do. And so I have no doubt that the, there is a resilience in the people of, of our region. But the task ahead of us is becoming more and more daunting every day. And there's a term that I heard recently when we talked about the lack of economies of scale in the Caribbean. And to make up for that, we need economies of speed. Economies of speed. And so if it, if it seems for, for many of you that we seem to be rushing to achieve things and to get things done, is because it is that, that, that sense of helplessness, that sense of, of fear, um, and that we know that we're underdogs to begin with. And so I, I ask for your patience and your consideration, and that when we're, when, we're, when we're standing here, as the Prime Minister did, and saying that for 15 years we've been talking about the unfair um, categorization of us as being middle-income countries and high-income countries <coughs> by the OECD, uh, it, it's, it's, it's with that sense of frustration um, that we're even uh, more uh, determined to make changes. This situation is even more uh, important for the OECS. And so uh, I also wear the hat as the chairman of the OECS. And I think even the same way that we're asking for dispensation with regards to the SIDS around the world, within the CARICOM region, we're asking even for that special dispensation for the OECS. And I'm very proud of the work that we've been able to achieve with the support of the CARICOM Secretariat and with SIDEMA, and in particular the Prime Minister Mitchell, who is also from the OECS, but also Chairman of CARICOM, and that we have to really have a special dispensation for the OECS. So we want to control our own destiny, and, and all we're asking for is some basic changes, and as I've pointed out in several meetings, all the changes we're talking about is a pen. Nobody has to do anything else other than change a policy, a policy that is, is preventing us from being able to help ourselves. So we've talked about the OECD. The next one really is this idea of a fund. We need it to be real. We need to be able to leave COP this time, hopefully with a motion that's passed that says allow the SID countries to be treated differently than everybody else. And that the timeline is going to be expedited. And that the time for talk for us has run out. Because these storms are upon us. And the storms have already created a devastating effect on us. And so we, we, we don't have the ability of waiting anymore. We need the resources to be made available. We then need to talk about how we're going to draw down on those resources. And again, this is the accountability that the Prime Minister is talking about. I mean, in the sake of accountability, does it take, should it take two, three, and four years to be able to draw down on funds? I mean, are, are we saying that as, as human beings that we're not intelligent enough to put systems in that are more effective to achieve the same thing, but at the same time allowing us to be able to move forward? This has to change. And then the big one is, is that it's impossible for us to be able to borrow funds, even at concessionary rates, and maintain our macroeconomic account targets. Debt to GDP. Our uh, credit ratings. So if we're going to borrow these monies to be able to invest in building resilience in our countries, it's going to come at an economic cost. And so can we not sit down and, and agree that either these are going to be off the balance sheet items or that there's going to be a longer period of time to amortize these investments? Because it is, it's, it's impossible to be able to achieve what we have to, given that we must spend this money. Because if we do not spend this money on building resilience in our country, 
then every other investment that we have in our country will be undermined. Even the idea of insurance, we have CRIF that has been doing an amazing job, but you don't have to be a genius to know that if we don't build resilience in our region, that the ability of CRIF to continue to source funds in order to pay out to us becomes an impossibility. And that is CRIF which is driven by the governments, far less the private sector insurance companies, who eventually at some point are going to say, we're not going to provide insurance. That's the reality. So the, 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 there is no option but to spend this money on building the resilience. I want to leave as my last message that the Caribbean region, CARICOM, as well as the SIDS around the world, need to understand that we must show the world that this is a priority. And one of the ways of doing that is to collectively get together and coordinate our votes at the UN and support the appointments of countries to boards that are going to stand up and make these changes happen. And, I, and I'm saying to you that we need to focus on the things that we can control ourselves. And this is a way in which the SIDS around the world, 51 of them, can show that this is a priority. That we must, we, must, we must let everybody know by our actions that this is a priority. And that 51 votes at the UN can make a significant difference. And I'm really hoping and appealing to my lead Prime Minister uh, to take charge of this. Um, I spoke to some of the other Prime Ministers last night, and they're willing to support it. And I'm hopefully we can have some meetings very quickly. And to, to, to coin the phrase again, we need economies of speed in making this happen. So again, I want to thank all of you um, for giving us a listening ear. I don't want you to ever believe that we're asking for sympathy. All we're asking for is the ability to take control of our own destiny. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. I told you about the passion in his voice when he speaks of those issues. UNDP has been partnering with us um, quite a bit, uh, not only this morning, but uh, also partnering with us to put on the the pledging conference in New York next week. But they also partnered with us uh, over the past several years on the vulnerability issue in terms of getting it to the dark as well. So Joe is here as the director of risk reduction. And Joe, please. Good morning, everybody. What, what possibly can I add after these two amazing uh, speeches by the Honorable Prime Ministers, uh, the, the understanding of the issue, the passion, the, the call for action, you know, what is left to say really. But I'm honored to be in your presence, Excellency, also yourself, uh, the SG from CARICOM, colleague from GCF, good morning everyone. Um, as I was listening, I forgot everything I was going to say and I will just focus a little bit on uh, some of the things we do at UNDP together with uh, SITS, together in the Caribbean and together with CARICOM. And I want to say this first in terms of uh, setting this meeting this morning in the context. Um, as those two storms hit um, the region in, in, uh, in September, the first reaction in my team was, okay, how are we going to use this opportunity? This sounds a bit cruel. And of course, we deployed immediately, we actually had deployed people ahead of the hurricanes in some of the uh, islands that we knew were going to be hit. We had people in, for instance, the Turks, we had people in Cuba and Dominica, although with Irma they were uh, avoided uh, much of the, of the damage this time around. Uh, and so we, we are there, we support. Um, but the point is, how can we use these events? And I really don't want to mean to be crude. The Chinese have, I think they say always, the word for a, uh, uh, a disaster is the same word uh, for opportunity. And this event this morning is part of that same series. It's just a way to get the message out. We are working with the OEC DAC uh, ahead of the Samoa uh, SITS conference a few years ago, three years ago, I think it was, uh, the pathway for the SITS, etc. We talked about improving vulnerability as a criteria, as Donald Prime Minister said, uh, for, for lending. So the solutions are all known. We know how to do this. We have the technology, we have the tools to get it done. And so why is it that we haven't gotten there yet, I think, is the really critical question. And so, as part of the engagement with the Caribbean region, as part of the engagement with, with CARICOM, one of our colleagues uh, went to Guyana to start a dialogue with uh, the CARICOM colleagues in terms of what we can do. We have, as you said, 
a big meeting coming up in New York to see whether we have the political momentum to, to really change some of those things, push the needle forward, and get to systemic differences uh, in place to get the resilience in the Caribbean in this particular case. But obviously, it's the sits around the world. And I would really welcome and salute if, if all 51 voices uh, can, uh, can push for this, because it clearly makes a difference. Um, so this is just a little bit of the context on the same. I want to thank you to come early this morning because it's an event that we put on at very short notice where we will carry the message on social media see if we're getting, you know, there's tweets going out and uh, 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 we're going to be recorded and so on. So I hope we will contribute to, to this. Now a couple of other reflections only in terms of how as UNDP we've been looking at this and as you know we've been working systematically in the Caribbean region with Sedima and others with the national authorities. We are now uh, you mentioned, uh, Excellency, the Secretary General. Uh, we have set up a one UN team uh, in Dominica to support the recovery. And I want to start by saying just one figure. We've completed uh, the post-disaster needs assessment together with our friends from the World Bank, the EU, and others in Dominica. And the initial estimate is that 200% of GDP has been the impact of this storm. Now, I don't know. That much about Dominica, but as I'm sorry, I've actually never put, put foot on the island. Uh, but that's a steep bill. And uh, I don't think we can, in the context now that here we are at the Climate Change Conference, simply recognize this is not the doing of the region. And I think, uh, I don't, as UDP, I don't, cannot, don't want to go into politics of this. But from a climate perspective, we need to do the right thing in actually providing the resources and the support to build resilience. And as I said, we have, even within the region, all the solutions that we need to build that resilience. The other thing, though, however, is also that we do need to look at some innovative tools. So, yes, we need to get uh, this vulnerability criteria into the uh, conditions to access financing. But we also need to work with the private sector most deliberately on some of these innovative financing solutions that are out there. Uh, there's ways to deal with the private sector, it's moving very, very fast. And yes, we need to deal with the risk of that. They want to have a certain, uh, um, you know, risk, I don't want to say risk-free, but a risk, an appropriate risk profile. But there is interest from the private sector to do this. And um, Secretary General, you remember the days when we did the political champions and we worked on insurance. Well, out of all of that now, we have the Insurance Development Forum. Uh, we have set up a center in London to look at that. One of the initial places the World Bank I know is looking at with the UK government is actually to roll out additional insurance products and look at what we can do in the Caribbean beyond and in addition to the cliff. Um, it's not an easy proposition, but it's a feasible proposition. And at the um, conference next week in New York, for those of you that will be in New York, we have two sessions specifically to talk about these innovative financing mechanisms and the insurance sector. But what we also have to do, and this is really my last point because we started a bit late and there's much more important people to speak uh, than, than the NDP here, um, is we have to do what is right in the country from a development perspective also. Uh, and we have to tackle, it was mentioned several times, vulnerability and understand what does actually drive vulnerability. And most fundamentally, of course, we're going to look at poverty. We're going to look at building codes, as uh, the Prime Minister Mitchell said. We're going to look at land management decisions. We're going to look at where are we building. Is it a wise thing not to talk to Caribbean now, but if you look just at hurricanes that have hit the U.S., and I was in New York on Hurricane Sandy uh, in 2012, uh, a devastated part of the New Jersey shore, a devastated part of the Rockaway Beach, those of you that know New York, well, we're building right next to where <coughs> we've been before. From a climate change perspective, that's perhaps not a smart way. I understand why people want that. These are hard decisions for communities to do. If you talk about moving a community, it's not an easy thing. But we need to look at doing development right. It was mentioned again by the Prime Minister's risk-informed development. And I think I want to conclude by simply saying that we need to find the political will and courage in the countries to do development the right way. And I think what we heard this morning, there is clearly the leadership that we need. We need to do the right thing within the region to find the political will and the coalitions beyond governments, because it takes more than, than just the governments to do the right thing. And we need to find the political will in the international community as well. And I'm also pointing back at us at UNDP and our friends in the World Bank, you know, uh, uh, bilaterals and so on. We cannot continue working the way we did in the past, where we basically all did our thing. You don't build resilience systematically, sustainably, if everybody works in their corner. 
And so I hope that this little meeting here this morning uh, will contribute to get the voices out. It is just one piece in that path towards uh, doing, doing the right thing. I thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you very much to CARICOM for reaching out to us and to, to co-host this event with us this, this morning. And thank you very much to you on the panel for your very powerful words. Thank you. In case that you're going to be in New York, it's Monday the 20th, it's a technical session, and a high-level session at which prime, uh, two Prime Ministers, other Prime Ministers, uh, Secretary Guterres, and other um, dignitaries will be present. Uh, it's on the 21st at, uh, at the UN building. Baroness Patricia <coughs> Butler, as I said, um, Secretary of the Commonwealth, but also a Caribbean woman, and a Dominican, and she was in Dominica. Okay. We're neighbors in Dominica, incidentally. Um, I saw the destruction of her home, I think she saw mine. It gives me great pleasure. And also, uh, Kong has a, a program on, on climate resilience and uh, mm -hmm. has a tremendous amount of work on vulnerability as well. Firstly, can I say what a great privilege it is to be part of this um, magnificent panel? because we have everything here with us. Two very distinguished Prime Ministers who have each had the experience of suffering the impact of climate change and are themselves the embodiment of resilience because the fact that they're here is quite something. UNDP, a partner with the Secretariat and with the Commonwealth for as long as I can remember, and the fund, the Climate Change Fund, who we look to anxiously to assist us to deliver the resilience that we aspire to have. So I want you all, just for a moment, to look at our panel, and then to look at each of yourselves because the time is now and we jointly share the responsibility with my dear friend, the Secretary General of CARICOM. And I want to say that this is our moment because if not us, who? And if not now, when? We in the Commonwealth have been talking about the existential threat of climate change since 1989. So almost 30 years ago, the Commonwealth was the first to say climate is something which is here, which we are going to have to deal with, and we are going to have to deal with swiftly. And that banging of the drum has been an important start because that beat was a beat that we had to keep in order to deliver change for the people who are affected by it. But let us just look for a moment as what it means. And I speak as we've been told not only as Secretary General of the Commonwealth responsible and uh, for 52 countries, 31 of which are small uh, developing states, 2.4 billion people, but as the Secretary General of a region, each six regions have been affected by climate change this summer. So I want us to remember that it's not just we in the Caribbean who have been devastated. We've had mudslides in Sierra Leone, we've had floods in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan. We have had the ring of fire alighted in the Pacific with Vanuatu, and we've had the devastation in our region. So this is not some of us, it's all of us. And in case Europe has forgotten, we had Ophelia in Ireland, and orange skies in London. So this change is real, it's immediate, and it's now. So what are we collectively 
going to do about it because I think the UNDP are right. This is an opportunity for us, in effect, to put our money where our mouth is, planet fund. Because we need to be speedy and we need to be able to act together. There is no longer any time for ineffective, non-collaborative work. It's going to take all of us to deliver the change that we need. And what does that actually mean? Because it's been said we know what to do. Do we? Because if we know what to do, the regenerative model that the Commonwealth has been talking about has to be implemented now. We have an opportunity to turn both the uh, restorative work that we have to do in uh, Dominica and in Barbuda, as the, and we can turn those into the petri dish for change and development for everyone else. We in the Commonwealth have uh, created the uh, Climate Change Finance Access Hub, and putting advisors on the ground to work with our countries in order to deliver the changes that we need. And that's one of the elements. We're working with the UNDP, the World Bank, and others on developing a vulnerability index which will better respond. And we've got to work on debt and debt management because I think the Prime Ministers both identified the enormity of the problem when you are building something to build that better and that itself is destroyed and the debt gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So what do we do? I did have the privilege last week of going to Barbuda and then going to the country of my birth, uh, Dominica. And just want to give you a tiny insight of what I saw, not just my own home and that of the Secretary General's, and we live about three doors away from each other. And as he said, he was able to see the devastation of my home, and I was able to see the devastation of his, and that's real. But I want you just to imagine for a moment um, what I saw. I went into part of our country called Point Michel, Point Michel, and there sitting in the middle of the rubble was a woman who looked totally devastated. She was sitting in the middle of what used to be her home. The only element that remained was the foundation stone and three steps. There was a fridge freezer on one side and there was a mattress on the other. And those are the only two items left recognizable from what used to be her home three days before the hurricane hit. She had celebrated the ninth birthday of her son. The thing that they removed from that storm was their lives. Everything else was gone. And it was ridiculous to say to that woman, she was a middle class, middle income person. Because she might have been two hours before the storm, but after it, she's utterly destitute. And that is our reality. So I do think we have an opportunity, but that opportunity is going to demand all of us working together. And I absolutely have committed the Secretariat to do everything we can to work in conjunction with everyone else. And I am also working with Antonio Guterres and Amina Mohammed, uh, the Deputy Secretary General. We have committed ourselves to refreshing an MOU, a stronger MOU, on all these issues. But I think now we better talk about, so what are we going to do? Enough of what we're going to say, how do we collectively make this happen? And I believe we can do it, because it is our task now. And I believe that together, we will deliver the change we need to see in the world. If we choose, I'm choosing, I know the panel is, and so what I'm saying is, how about you? Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. And what struck me, uh, you were 
but you know, make a, a week and a half ago to last week, and people are still walking about in a bit of a days uh, the level of the magnitude of the disaster. Mr. Pa Usman Jaju, you've heard it all, and um, I believe the uh, anticipation and expectation of the green climate trend is high, so I invite you to the podium uh, to address us. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure to join uh, distinguished panelists, uh, particularly uh, Your Excellencies, uh, the Secretary General, the Commonwealth Chairman, uh, colleagues uh, yeah, present. I am not going to go into other issues, but just focus on what we want to do for you. I want to re-echo our commitment to support uh, as a fund, we were mandated to support developing countries, particularly the most vulnerable seeds and agencies. So we are here to support you and we have programs that are geared towards building the resilience of your nations. The readiness program is here and as the Prime Minister of Grenada alluded to, the readiness program is here to support you, build or put in place building codes that would withstand some of the adverse impacts of climate change. But specifically what we want to do is to go and visit you as a team. We originally planned to go to Grenada and Antigua and Barbuda. And this was a plan that was geared towards really reviewing some of the project proposals that we received from them, particularly following uh, the ministers, the minister of Grenada's visit to Sondo as a follow-up to the 2017 uh, Caribbean dialogue that we had, the structural dialogue. And what we are doing now is to widen the scope of this mission. Uh, we have uh, the team from my division, country programming, going with the private sector, going with uh, the unit from risk, and the division of mitigation and adaptation. We would be going to Antigua and Barbuda. First of all, we would attend uh, the New York summit uh, next week. Uh, the team would go, and then we would join the high-level uh, police summit in Grenada. We would meet with your NDAs and teams to see how we can support you really expedite some of the proposals that you have submitted to us. Um, we want to see action on the ground, so the response is to work with you, expedite your requests, your readiness requests, your, 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 your project proposals, so that we can see an implementation coming very soon. From Grenada, we we'll go to Antigua and Barbuda, we we'll go to Haiti, we would go to Dominica, we will go to Barbados to really work with all of you. So we will be looking at the private sector, uh, we, will be looking, we will be working with uh, the civil society, we will be working with your direct access entities that you have identified as a team because uh, sometimes when you send one person from only one area, uh, they are confronted with other questions that they are not uh, aware of and they cannot be able to respond adequately. So we are going as a team to ensure that when we go, we work to finish or we work to almost finalizing your proposal so that by the, uh, almost maybe by the next quarter, we would be towards really seeing the light uh, at the tunnel. So I want to bring this message to you from uh, our executive director that uh, we are going to support you, and this is just uh, the first mission that we'll be going. 
I know the countries that I have mentioned are not all the countries uh, in the Caribbean, but uh, this is just a first start, and this is going to be the approach that we would take in the coming years, particularly in 2018. We have just launched the simplified approval process that was being championed by uh, Ambassador Faturi, who is uh, yours. So we think you can also seize this opportunity because this is a simple process that requires minimum data requirements in terms of baselines. It uh, requires minimum environmental and social safeguards. And at our level, the process, uh, the approval process will also be simplified. So the template is going to be simplified and we hope you would seize this opportunity, which is going to be a pilot. Uh, initially, we allocated uh, 80 million US dollars and uh, we hope with the enthusiasm that uh, we're hearing uh, in the corridors, uh, you would submit proposals and then it would give us an opportunity to go back to the board and ask for more resources. We have the National Adaptation Plan and Adaptation Processes, uh, which currently is resourced to the tune of 50 million US dollars. Uh, we can support you with your adapt adaptation plans. We understand most of you have the gain apps, so you have a foundation uh, to really integrate adaptation and ensure that adaptation and disaster reduction really speak to each other. So you can use uh, our, our NAP process to really uh, build on what you have under your gain apps. Next year, uh, we are requesting 100 million US dollars for the NAP process to really support you. And the readiness is also, we've also requested about 50 million US dollars for readiness. So as part of the readiness, as I said, you have the opportunity of really uh, harmonizing some of your policies or revising the policies, having building codes. You can also seek for support for direct access entities. We can accompany you to really build the institutional uh, capacities of your institutions to access funds from us. We are ready to work with you. We are ready to work with your regional uh, bodies. When the team comes, they will also be discussing some of your regional projects to ensure that uh, they move to friction. So, in order not to delay you, I just want to re-echo and reaffirm our commitment to supporting you. And we will be with you throughout this journey to build the resilience of your communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jaju. I should have mentioned that Mr. Jaju was, before he took up his appointment, the Minister of the Environment from of the Gambia. So uh, it comes with political experience. Uh, Joe, how much time do we have? Okay. Uh, we have five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> All right. Can you uh, make it ten? <laughs> <laughs> we can make it we ten. We have some mics uh, in case anybody um, uh, from the floor would like to ask a question or make an observation. I'm sure, Mr. Jaju, you've heard, um, and, and this is a, a general plea that our region uh, requires as much uh, money for resilience building and yes, mitigation. Yes, please. Um, yes, I know we have very limited time. Firstly, um, I'm a Caribbean national myself, and I'm very, very proud of, um, of the job that both prime ministers did. I was very touched to listen to you. However, I have um, some short things I'd like to hear your opinion on. Firstly, um, this um, climate change problem, as we know, all of this damage is really the symptom. The disease is the rising um, temperature, as you both have underlined very, very clearly. So the question is, um, is CARICOM, is the Caribbean going to tackle the question from that side as well? Because even if they give us 800 million, next year we may need 600 million more, and the year following that, because it will continue to come to us. That's one. So do we tackle that at that level? Secondly, what does... Um, Dr. Mitchell think about appointing an environmental czar for the entire Caribbean, who would then focus these issues, including the funding. You know, in other words, we have somebody channeled to do this. Thirdly, what is the role of CDB, or the Caribbean Development Bank, and how do we refashion that bank to ensure that that, that kind of funding is necessary? And finally, um, 
we have we had in Trinidad and Tobago an environmental fund, as you know, and there are billions of dollars in that fund. What do you think that the Caribbean having to depend upon itself? Shouldn't we also, the other states, Grenada, St. Vincent and so on, have such a fund? Those are my you know, I'd like to hear what you have to say about those things. The five questions. Very, very good questions. In terms of what is it we're going to do, I think there's a two two prong answer. Um, you know, I was just speaking to my colleague minister on the way here, and I, I've always learned in life that when there is chaos um, and uncertainty, focus on the things that you can control. So right now, it is about building resilience and accepting what the reality is. But I have to say to you that I am very heartened by the leadership of Macron in, in France. I'm also heartened by Xi Jinping of, of China, um, and also recently um, uh, England in terms of the changes in the OECD. So we're starting to see now uh, a global leadership taking place. So despite the fact that the United States seems to be wavering on where it wants to go, um, we're seeing that the rest of the world is ignoring that and, and getting on with the job. And I, mean, I really want to commend um, uh, President Macron um, for what he's been doing and the effort and the energy that he's been bringing to this issue. And obviously we're here in Germany um, who have hosted this event um, on behalf of Fiji. And uh, uh, Virgil has been an, an, an amazing uh, champion for these issues. So the, the big thing is, is can they rise now to the occasion of the SIDS? Because, as I said to you, the cast has been died for us already. Um, it's going to require a remarkable change globally, um, but that's outside of our, uh, of, our, our, of our remit right now. All we can do is continue to encourage their leadership. But I think that we must take responsibility for what we can do, which is to build that resilience. Um, and I, I think the Baroness is correct um, in the sense that we've got to clearly define what that is. I mean, for me, in my mind, slope stabilization strengthening of our rivers, putting our utilities underground, um, uh, better drainage, um, and building up the Sedema so that it has its own equipment um, and then has the capacity even afterwards where the United States has what they call the Corps of Engineers. So to your point, maybe on a regional basis we should have a Corps of Engineers. We saw what happened in Haiti, we're seeing what's happening in Dominica and that the amount of money that's being made available, as limited as it is, is still substantial um, and that we're not able to, to, to draw down on those funds. So that's a, a recurring theme that maybe from a regional perspective we need to be able to step in from that perspective. So I'm going to pass on to the Prime Minister to deal with some of the other issues that you brought up. Yeah, my brother, first of all, let me just say I think yeah, the, the questions are extremely relevant um, um, that you asked. I don't know what you want to call it an uh, environmental czar. Maybe you already have a czar. <laughs> <laughs> That's not its title, but we could call it such. Uh, but, you know, seriously, I, I honestly believe because of recent events, and it has really raised the temperature of our thinking process as far as the whole question of environmental issues are concerned. And, and of course, our ability to deal with natural disasters. And as growing up, as a boy in my commun communities, we only knew about, it was supposed to be every 50, 60 years, you get a hurricane in, in Grenada. That is how we knew it. So most time we heard about possible hurricane. We, we didn't take it seriously until I found a card in 2004. And I have to be the Prime Minister that had to go through this experience. So I think, um, I, I honestly believe at the next heads of government of the region, I'm, I'm going to propose as the outgoing chairman that we do have a serious discussion and make some decisions as far as the whole issue of disaster is concerned. Um, and treating it as an issue that has to be at every single um, heads of government meeting and uh, to take some serious decision as far as building codes are concerned. Uh, Prime Minister already mentioned building the Code of Engineers, um, but a team dedicated towards looking at solutions at all levels, not just the whole question of building codes, but also the question of the, uh, how we deal with the tourism product. If something like if this, God forbids, we get another one like this, uh, and it's happening anyhow, 
So I, I think there's a general understanding that we have to move. I, as I said, I don't know whether the word czar might be overused in, in context of the, the community, world community. But um, I just want to say also, the CDB, as chairman of CDB and the Board of Governors, uh, I know there's been significant um, initiative in the whole question of uh, mobilizing resources. And so far, we've been reasonably very successful. Only the um, day before yesterday, we had um, the signing of additional resources from the EIB for on lending to, to Caribbean countries to deal with issues of, of disaster and resilience of, uh, the region as a whole. Um, maybe the process of, of lending and of course some of the conditions could be, uh, could be reduced considerably so. In fact, I think so many times our institutions are, and um, some of the, the, the processes are so, so cumbersome and bureaucratic. Sometimes it takes too much of, of time and, um, to be able to get things on the ground, so to speak. So I think um, that's an area we have to work at CDB, to how do we get CDB to be more, uh, more progressive in terms of um, the decision-making process. That, that is one of the things I think we have to do. But CDB has been playing its role, and we look forward to it continue to play even a bigger role, because it's really the only real development bank in the entire region. Um, so I, I must say that we are, we are certainly looking at it. And in terms of your first question, quickly, what is illness being global warming. Yeah. 1.5 to stay alive is language. 1.5 is language that the Caribbean along with the Sint and Oasis put on the table at COP21. Our scientists are now engaged in looking at the science and what it means for us so that we can take it forward. So that's the work we're doing. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, hello. I'm Judy Sewell here from Mother Channel Internet Television and Cape Town TV, which is Southern Africa and Satellite. Um, I've been to um, a, a mangrove conference yesterday and they said that they had now realized that if they hadn't exploited the mangroves to the extent they had, they wouldn't have had to relocate the cities after these hurricanes. In 2002 there was an article in our newspaper that said global warming, this is our final warning, and it spoke of hypercanes of unimaginable fury that struck the earth from the ground. So when I heard about this one that was coming through that they didn't, they said it was a monster, I knew that this is the beginning of the period that we've been worried about. But the one thing that seems to be quite cheerful about to, for, the, for this group here is that it seems, I, I came in very late, but it seems like we've got here some of the top people in, the, in, in each of these regions, and they are really earnestly trying to do the things that need to be done. Whereas it seems that for the majority of conferences that I've been attending, that the, 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 the number of people that are saying that the governments are not actually representing them at all. And I was wondering whether we couldn't have these leaders <laughs> um, bring in another COP, a people-centered COP, because you're, you're, the, you're doing things the way we ought to be doing them, where we really are saying we are going to just do these things. We're not going to be affected by all the big boys who are trying to continue to squeeze the last bit of money out of the fossil fuel and chemical industries and nuclear. Okay. So, so would you be prepared to do such a thing? Yeah. Um, you know, St. Lucia um, has a Nobel laureate, um, Sir Arthur Lewis, um, uh, who had an incredible development theory uh, for, for lesser developed countries. I mean, in fact, it's the theory that, was, that helped establish Singapore. And um, we're hoping to announce very soon that St. Lucia in collaboration with Singapore, that we're going to be starting a new conference called the Sir Arthur Lewis Think Small. Um, uh, summit. And Think Small is about bringing things back down to the micro level. And I think that that's the mistake that we're making with small states, is that these larger institutions are prejudging us and imposing policy theories on us that cannot work. And so the theories actually have to originate from the ground. Um, so I was criticized very heavily recently um, at a, a UN meeting in which um, maybe I wasn't as supportive of the SDG goals as I ought to be. And, and my point is, is that if in fact the individual persons are struggling to, to survive, if a mother is trying to figure out how she's going to send her children to school or where the next meal is going to come from, there's no way that they're going to discuss SDGs. 
So we can be at this top level talking SDGs all we want to and we can give it all the credibility that it deserves, but the actuality of it being absorbed is not going to happen until I think the world accepts a minimum standard of living. That every single citizen of this, of this world deserves that. Deserves access to health care, access to education, to have a roof over their head, and to get meals. So when you turn on the TV and you see some of the things that are taking place in, in the world today, and the conflicts that are taking place, we have failed. And there's absolutely no way that you're going to get unanimity in the world towards the SDG goals, which are absolutely necessary in order for us to rise. So I don't, I don't want to minimize the importance of SDGs. I'm just saying the success of the SDGs is going to be undermined by um, the individual if we don't take care of each individual. So I, I, I often say that one thing that every single big company has in common is they all started small. Okay? And so as politicians, if we can't support policies that are going to resound to the benefit of the individual persons, that individual person, then we're going to fail. And then that's why we're saying it's time for the world to think small. Because sometimes we think too big, and um, those, those bigger thoughts are going to be undermined by the fact that the rest of us are not going to be able to support it. So I just want to say your point is very, very clear. The continuous changes in governments around the world should be a very clear indication that the individuals are revolting. Okay? That they themselves are recognizing the insensitivity of these bigger policies. And so it is, I think behooves all of us to be able to accept that. And I, you know, this is why I said he's my mentor, because I think um, Prime Minister Mitchell has never said it, but has practiced that from, from the get-go. Um, you know, he's twice in his career, he's won all the seats um, in a country. That's no <laughs> easy <laughs> thing. <laughs> well, and not only that, he did it and maintained strong democracy, which is really incredible uh, to say. So. Thank you very much. I'm ready for consultation. <laughs> <laughs> Think small and economies of speed. These are your takeaways from here. Can we? Just one, oh, one more. Sure, yes, Pierre. So, so yeah. Someone wants a question. Yeah. No. Then, uh, you go ahead. I'll be, I'll, 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 I'll be very short, Honorable Prime Minister. Um, it, it would really be remiss of me not to make a, a comment. Um, I'm here on behalf of Dame Meg Taylor, who's the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Foreign Secretariat, and I'm her deputy. Um, and I think that um, you know the call for solidarity of small island developing states um, is one that resonates with us. Um, as many of you would know, the Pacific Islands region um, is, like yourselves, um, one of the most hazard-prone regions in the world, and particularly now uh, you know, with climate change. And uh, Fiji and Vanuatu, in the last two years, suffered Category 5 um, the tropical cyclones. Um, I would offer that um, of our 18 member states, we have 14 small island developing states or large ocean states, as we like to call ourselves. And we do have to um, act in solidarity um, and we will be in support um, of our Caribbean uh, brothers and sisters. There are many um, aspects, I think, that we can um, work together on and learn from. Uh, we have the Pacific Disaster Risk uh, Financing um, instrument similar to your uh, Caribbean catastrophe risk insurance facility um, and we also have recently endorsed, our leaders have recently endorsed the framework for resilient development in the Pacific which seeks to um, integrate climate change and disaster risk into development but I think as many of you said um, really looking at the whole risk spectrum from risk prevention through to low carbon development through to being prepared and able to respond and recover from disasters or extreme events. So I, um, I am um, optimistic, I think, if we can actually work together. And as Baroness Scotland mentioned, um, I think the time is now, because it is not if, it's when. Um, but I just wanted to make that comment because um, I attended um, in solidarity of um, regions and small island developing states. Thank you very much. Thank you, and let me thank our distinguished panelists. Oh, oh sorry, panelists. I just want one point I want to make before I close. Um, something I witnessed just just recently and has implications for. Um, I was in the capital of my country two weeks ago, and the the 
the sun was as bright as ever, shining. And if one of my ministers WhatsApp me some pictures of major flooding and washing away bridges and homes in a, in, on, on his WhatsApp. So I asked, I call him, I said, but you didn't tell me you're going to any other country. You didn't. Usually you have to tell the Prime Minister when you're leaving. He said, Prime Minister, I'm here in Grenada. The pictures I sent you is from another part of the country. And the middle part of the country, homes are being washed up. Bridges washed away. And it, it, it tells me something, that something is happening at Israel that I've never seen this in my life, in, in my country before. And people who are 90 odd years old saying they've ne never seen anything like this. So there's no doubt about we've seen a phenomenon that is something that is clearly something that we have to understand in a very serious way. But you know what? What is significant about this is that knowing what I just saw in Dominica, knowing what I just saw in, in BVI and, and, and Aguila, I said, if I go and make noise or I need help, it look like if I've been selfish. So I take my little licks quietly. <laughs> so far, as you, that's the note I wanted to end on. <laughs> if I can just want to add one thing that, um, in terms of the solidarity that, that, you're talk, that you're talking about, we need to learn our lesson that we got marginalized as countries during the, 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 the recession in 2008. So the bigger countries got together and went from the G7 to the G20 met on a quarterly basis to resolve the financial problems of, that they had. And we had to sit there wait patiently. And I remember uh, going to a G77 meeting, which was in Dubai, not Dubai, in, um, in Qatar, um, where we had to fight just to get a meeting at the UN to discuss the issue, right? We need to understand that we cannot allow that to happen again. So when we talk about coming together from a solidarity perspective, that we need to know that there are countries that are going to be on the G7 and the G20 that are going to take up the issues and our causes as strongly as we would. We have to make sure that when we support people who are going to be on the Security Council, that our voice is going to be heard. And that every single opportunity that the SIDS have of electing somebody to be the Secretary General of international organizations around the world, we must do it. And the fact is, is that if we don't do it, then we only have ourselves to blame because 51 votes can achieve those things. And so anyone who comes and tells me about the sad stories and is not willing to make that level of sacrifice to change their own life, then they're not serious. And I think that we have to call a spade a spade. But certainly the bigger countries are laughing at us because all we do is become, the perception is that we're crying and we're begging and that when it comes to doing the right thing, we don't. So I think to, to the point that was being made by the Baroness, it is time for us to do the right thing. It's far time for us to take control of our own destiny. Um, and I, I'm certainly, I know, hopefully speaking on behalf of, of, of the Prime Minister, that we, we need to move quickly. So even at the potential meeting of the UN, if our ambassadors can start meeting and start putting out a, a, road map, a road map as to what the next steps are, but we have to take control of our own destiny. Let us learn from what happened in the financial crisis. If we just sit on the, on the sidelines and make no noise, we will get nothing. Lastly, I just wanted to uh, say how this meeting has reaffirmed uh, my determination that we should aggressively look at the regenerative model of development, which includes all the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement, but takes it down to the local level, which takes advantage of all the things that we know will work and applies it in a way that will make the difference. And I think that synthesis is going to be essential. So I very much listened to what both the Prime Minister said. There's no point in us having hermetically sealed <coughs> areas where we say this is SDG, this is Paris, and this is local. We need one conjoined, regenerative, inclusive, synthesized approach which makes it easy to translate those values to the people on the ground. And just to reassure people, if you want to look at the SDGs and where they come from, look at the Commonwealth, 
charter because we, 53 then countries, came up with that charter, 1 to 16, and if you look at the charter, it's 1 to 16 of the SDGs. And SDG 17 is the most important. That's partnership. And partnership is right at the core of what the Commonwealth stands for, and it's in our preamble. So I think let's not divide, let's consolidate, integrate, synthesize, regenerate, because we can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you.